now or wait till you tell us? No, hand them out. Okay. Way to go. All right, we've got some handouts coming out. If you didn't get one, just raise your hand. If you don't want one, don't raise your hand. It'll just save on any note taking. There's an off chance that you might hear something that could be helpful. That's the goal. Anyway, um, my name's Don. I live near Seattle, and I like hanging out with you guys. Uh, my current role is to serve as the network leader, which makes me Brent's boss. So he's not in this room. I don't think his wife is in this room. So at the end of the session, I'd be happy to tell amazing stories on him. So you guys can embarrass him, you know, on Facebook or however you want to do that. So, yeah. Nice to be with you. Um, I told Brent that if I have the opportunity to talk to 20-somethings that have 50 years left or 50-somethings that have 20 years left, give me the 20-somethings. I love investing in lives that are younger than me, and I think that's almost everybody in the room. Okay? So uh, I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump in. We're going to go right to the deep end of the pool. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, people here with their hands up. They're either asking Christ into their heart, or they need a manual. Either one. There you go. Maybe both. That's good. All right, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for teaching us courage. Amen. That's what this is about. Learning how to be courageous. Cour courage is a choice. Everyone here in this room is a leader. You lead something or you lead someone. You start at least by leading yourself. Maybe you're a leader at work, you're a leader in the church. That's why you are here, because you believe in leadership. And at some point in your life, either personally, in your job, or in your ministry, at some point in your life, you will be called upon to make a courageous decision. Now here's the good news. God will always give you grace to make that courageous decision. Here's the bad news. Once you've made that courageous decision, you're promoted to the next level, and the next courageous decision will be harder than the first one. But you don't need to be afraid of that. Because God's grace is going to go to that next level with you. Courage is what establishes you as a leader. Fear is what holds you back. If you will not allow God to deal with the fears in your life, you will be stuck at a particular level. And then you will hit 60 years old someday and you will look back and you say, if only I had that time over again, I wish I could do, I wish I would have. Leaders challenge what is for the sake of what could be. As a leader, you see something. You identify something that could happen. The challenging process, though, of seeing something that doesn't exist yet and moving towards that, the challenging part of that process requires courage. And you recognize that the need is not just leadership alone. It's not just seeing what could be. It's seizing what could be. Leaders are the ones who have the courage to act on what they see. Leaders are the ones who say publicly what everyone else is thinking privately. It's not the insight that sets leaders apart from the crowd. It's their courage to initiate change. Now, I'm going to stop and give you the blanks because I don't have any PowerPoint. So just zero in. The landscape of leadership makes courage an essential ingredient. You will never follow Jesus without exhibiting courage at some point. Leadership is often like a walk in the dark. It's like driving at night. You can only drive as far as you see, as you have lights in your headlights to see. If you stop moving, you, if you stop moving, you don't enter into any new territory. You've got to keep going in order to learn something new. The dark provides leaders, though, with their greatest, here's the blank, opportunities. Opportunities. I love the fact that the Chinese character, caricature, caricature call them konjis, for disaster also has within it opportunity. Challenge and opportunity go together. I saw um, the movie last night, uh, Hacksaw Ridge. Anybody seen it? Amazing story of faith. It's a bloody story. 
but this guy is an amazing person of faith and he is put in front of this incredible challenge which causes his courage to surface everyone else thought he was a coward but he stepped up that's what marks you as a leader courage is the primary element that will mark you as a leader the things that we dislike about leadership are the very things that create the need for leadership after all if the path were easy it would be crowded I want to walk you through four courageous bullet points. Here's the first one. Courage establishes leadership. Moses was a leader. His courage established him when he faced down Pharaoh. Peter was established as a leader when he spoke publicly on the day of Pentecost. Courage is essential for leadership because the first person to step out in a new direction is generally viewed as the leader. Now they might not be the smartest, they might not have even made the first observation, but they stepped out. The leader of any enterprise, let me give you the next two blanks, is not the smartest or the most creative. The leader is the one with the courage to initiate. Just do it. Start moving in that direction. Leaders are not always the one to see the opportunity. They're the ones to seize the opportunity. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know the name of the person that created the first computer? Anybody know? Nobody's ever, hardly anybody knows that. Okay. Do you know the name Bill Gates? Who created the first disk operating system that was marketed through IBM? because he saw the opportunity and he seized the opportunity. We don't know who is first in the category of development. We have no idea, but we know who did the marketing. Here's the second bullet point. Courage is not the absence of fear. I never get rid of my fear before I act in courage, not one time. As I look back over my life in ministry, I have never made a courageous decision, but what fear was my constant companion. Constant companion. Without fear, in fact, there is no need for courage. Courage is the ability and the willingness to carry our fears with us into the unknown. The individual who refuses to move until fear and uncertainty are gone will never move. Consequently, they will never lead. The goal should never be to get rid of fear. The goal is to act in spite of it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the picture of the couple that waited until they were ready to get married? until they bled fear out of the entire equation, they both go to the altar in their wheelchairs. Ancient, old, in their 80s. They waited until they were ready. You have a church full of people that are waiting until they re are ready, waiting until they know more. I love watching new Christians. I love watching them function. They are all tuned in. To what God is doing. I led this guy to Christ a, a couple years ago. His name's Carl. He was with me at a church that I spoke at uh, last Sunday, Shoreline. And he walked into this church and his eye immediately connected with people. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, I got some vibrations about that, which is code for the gifts of the Spirit are operating in my life, but I don't know enough of the Bible to tell you what I'm feeling. Okay? But he had the courage to speak out. I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, i got to go talk to that person. I said, that's exactly right. You don't have to have the nomenclature. You don't have to know the biblical address of where the truth is in order to function in that. All you need to do is know that you must move forward. You're going to act. All right. Max Dupree. An unwillingness to accept risk has swamped more leaders than anything I can think of. The outcome of unbridled fear missed opportunity now what motivates you the most are you more motivated because you don't want to fail or are you more motivated because you don't want to miss an opportunity which one of those two parts of the of this of the spectrum motivates you the most all right here's the third talking point on courage Courage to lead. We're going to do a case study of David. Most of you know David's story, so I'm going to walk through that. I'm not going to read you the scriptures. They're written for you. You can look them up on your own. David's leadership is one that was established. That's the blank. Established in an environment of uncertainty and fear. 
Because whenever there's great fear, there's great opportunity for leadership to be established. And when there is fear, great fear, then there is great opportunity. David seemingly shows up in a coincidental arrival, and that underscores a theme that's repeated in his life and the lives of other significant leaders throughout history. Leaders see and seize opportunity. David's leadership was established through his courage, not through his calling. I know a lot of men and women who are called but never step out to do anything with it. Because calling doesn't establish ministry. Courage establishes ministry. Calling really doesn't count for that much when the pressure's on. Hey, God called me. I thought he was going to make a way, which is code for uh, God called me. I thought there wouldn't be any problems. <laughs> there are problems because God called you. We are at war. Have you figured that out? You're wearing a uniform. There will be casualties, there will be victories, and there will be losses. We are at war. Killing Goliath did not make David a leader, but it marked him as one. And the incident in the Valley of Elah equipped David to lead. It, excuse me, it didn't equip him to lead, but it equated him as someone worth following. David was courageous but he was not careless. He didn't rush down into the valley, fueled by adrenaline and the prospects of becoming a national hero. There is a difference between acting courageously and acting carelessly. David was both courageous and careful. Now, let's talk about David for just a moment. David shows up at the battlefield. He picks up five stones to face Goliath. And there's this contrast between what it means to be fearful and what it means to be careful. I want to walk you through that. Number one, careful is cerebral. That is, it's intellectual. Fearful is emotional. A lot of times when you feel fear, if you'll just stop, sit down, and think, you'll create a new mental pattern for yourself to move forward. That's the difference between fear and care. Number two, careful is fueled by information. Fear is fueled by imagination. Isn't it interesting that both temptation and faith are fueled by our imagination? I want to suggest to you that imagination is part of the creation of God that's exhibited both in the first Adam and in the second Adam, Christ. God gave Adam the task of naming all of the animals, all the flower, everything. 5,000 orchids alone, that's a lot of work. The creativity that came out of that. A lot of creativity. And our imagination, gone evil, leads towards temptation. Our imagination filled with faith leads towards moving the kingdom forward. But your imagination is neutral. Just like money. Money is neutral. All your emotions are neutral. Well, hate's a bad emotion. No, it isn't. Scripture says to hate that which is evil. Well, jealousy's a bad No, Paul was jealous over the children of Israel with a godly jealousy. Is love always good? Don't love the world. You see, your emotions are neutral. Imagination is neutral, but it's going to be fueled one way or the other. Number three, careful calculates risk. Fearful avoids risk. If you live your life minimizing risk, bleeding risk out of every single decision until it gets down to zero, there's no risk at all. Can I just tell you that you are not pleasing God? You will not please God at all. And here's why. Faith pleases God. Isn't that true? Faith pleases God. So if I bleed risk out entirely, now I'm not here to be foolish. I mean, I think you need to plan. I need, you need to have a strategy. You need to have preparation. You need to get resources. God gave you a brain. Think things through. But believe me, you'll always be at least 20 to 30% shy of everything you need. Sometimes you'll be 80% shy. And God says, do it anyway. Number four, 
Careful wants to achieve success. Fearful wants to avoid failure. And number five, careful is concerned about progress. Fearful is concerned about protection. David's courage empowered others to act courageously. Now here's what happened. David shows up at the battlefield and he's hanging out with his brothers. Why did he go to the battlefield? Anybody know? He's carrying supplies to his brothers. The army did not pay for the soldiers' food. The family had to feed the soldiers. So David's brother, excuse me, David's father sends the food out to feed his brothers. Now, understand the tension here. The tension between David and his father, the tension between David and his brothers. When the prophet showed up at David's house, he brought in the seven boys and David stayed with the sheep. He didn't even count to come see the most famous man in Israel at that point. There's a little tension going on between the youngest kid in the family and dad. Then when the brothers come, so, uh, uh, the prophet Samuel says, call for him, he's anointed. His brothers look at him and despise him. What was he anointed to be? He's anointed to be king. What does he do after he's anointed? He cleans the oil off of his face and goes right back out and starts taking care of the sheep. I love that story. And then his father calls him and says, here, I want you to take this to your brothers, Eliab, Shammah. I want you to take them out to them. They, they need some food. And he gives him five cheeses. The five cheeses were very, very expensive food. And they were not to be given to his brothers. They were to be given to his captain, the captain of the brothers. Now, why is that? They were a bribe. Because in that day, the way you did battle is the front row fought with the front row in each army. And when the front row were all dead, then the second row became the front row and they kept fighting. So the further back you were in the army, the better chance you had of living through the day. So these cheeses are to bribe the captain to take his sons to put them further back. That's why he's there. And while he's looking for his brothers, he hears this one guy say, Wow. 40 days, in the morning and in the evening, this guy comes out and taunts us. I wonder who's going to take the king up on his offer. Because whoever kills the giant, their family is free from taxes, and they get to marry the king's daughter. Now remember where he came from. He's just coming from the family gathering where he is anointed to be king of Israel. If you are married... To the king's daughter, you're a prince. And a prince is a lot closer to being king than a shepherd is. It's at that point that David says, take me to the king, I'll fight. Now that's in verse 26 of 1 Samuel 16. If you look at verse 24, it says that Goliath stepped out, challenged Israel, the entire army ran including David. David had no courage, and here's the point, it's not in your notes. David had no courage until the power of vision captivated his heart. And when the power of vision of being moved into the king's household, of marrying the king's daughter and becoming a prince to this king, that's the pathway that he saw. Now, that's not ultimately the pathway that God used, but that's the pathway that he saw that ignited his courage and his vision. It's only after he heard the reward that he said, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Let's go take him down. Before that, he ran like everybody else. David understood the value. And when he stepped up to fight Goliath, he was empowered to act courageously. When David killed Goliath, there was an immediate reversal of momentum on the battlefield. David, through one act of bravery, gave an entire army something they severely lacked, courage. Remember, one act of courage at a strategic moment. The largest church in the world, at one point anyway, I don't think it is right now, in Seoul, Korea, they were stuck in a building project. And the pastor called everybody and said, 
you know, we just don't have enough money and it's embarrassing national attention and all that. It was approaching, like I think at that point, like a half a million members in the church, massive church. And he said, we need, we need funding. And it was just tight. You could just tell that there was nothing going on. And finally, this widow woman who is very, very poor stepped up from the crowd and walked down front and she put her rice bowl and her chopsticks on the altar. She gave it to God. It's all she had. It's like the widow's two mites. And instantly a bidding war erupted with wealthy businessmen inside that. I wonder what would have happened if the boy with the loaves and fish hadn't come to Jesus, the widow woman with the rice bowl. You don't know what one small act of courage on your part can spark inside somebody's heart. David just said, who is this guy? Taken to the king, defeats Goliath, and is marked as a national leader because courage instills or produces courage inside other people. Courage is this amazing commodity. It goes from, yes, I can do it, to yes, we can do it, to yes, we have done it. All right, here's the fourth and the final um, talking point on courage. Let me give you three expressions of courage. Number one, courage to say no. In your life, you must be willing to say no more often than you say yes. If you say yes to every opportunity, to every engagement, to everything on your calendar, it diminishes the value and it will wear you out. What you say no to is as important, perhaps even more important. Now, um, quick survey here. How many of you are married? Just give me a wave. All right. You said a public no on your wedding day, didn't you? Okay. When I when I stood up on the on the on the uh, stage to marry my wife Brenda, it'd be forty years this next year that we did that. Marysville, Washington. I looked at her. We got married. I said no to every woman on the planet. They were weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> I said yes to her. There's no validity if I say yes to her but no on Tuesdays and Thursdays to her and yes to others. In fact, it disqualifies me from ministry if I don't say no to every other person and only yes to her. Are you tracking with me? You can't serve Jesus one day a week and follow your own heart and be your own God the other six. What you say no to is more important than what you say yes to. You have to have the courage to say no. Now you can say it kindly, and sometimes you don't say it right away. Sometimes it's let me think about it or I can get back to you on it. But you're going to have to be willing to say no. Now, let me ask you, because most of you are working with other leaders, either executive pastors, staff pastors, lead pastors, department heads, you're working with them. Do you have the courage to say no to power? Do you know how to respectfully, lovingly say, you know, I can't really do that. I appreciate you asking me, but I, I, I just can't do that. And if they press on you and you feel like you're violating your conscience to do that, what do you do? If you get pressured into being a part of something, and it might not be immoral, it probably won't be. I hope it isn't, of course. But it might be a crunch on your time that really compromises your family values, your family time. Can you say no? Early in the development of leaders, we assume that when opportunity knocks, we have to embrace, that's the next blank, whatever comes our way. Opportunity, though, does not equal obligation. The ability to identify and focus on a few key necessary things is the hallmark of great leadership. Don't allow the good many things and good opportunities to divert your attention from the one opportunity that has the greatest potential. Uh, last year I got a phone call. Um, I have a, a book out called Turnaround Pastor. By the way, if you're a credentialed minister here today and you don't have a copy of it, just let me know. We will mail you one free. We do that to all of our... Uh, how many credentialed ministers do we have? Are you credentialed? How many of you are thinking about it? Okay, how many of you made a decision, you're not there yet, but you're moving on to the paperwork, so that way, okay? Can I just extend the invitation? 
We would love to recognize you and your ministry. That's what, that's what credentialing does. It, it walks you through so you become a part of a community of ministry. Anyway, um, I wrote this book, and so it went all over the place, and I got this invitation. And I knew that I wanted to do that invitation, and my admin called, and she said, Don, they want you to, it was in Wisconsin, they want you to fly back and do this thing, um, but you're scheduled to be on Sabbath that day those two days, which is code for Brenda and I being together without any interruptions for two days in a row. And so I, I called her back, her name was Tony. I said, Tony, let me get back to you. I called her back in about 10 minutes and I said, would you tell them that I would love to do it, but I can't, I'm already booked. Don't, don't tell them what, what we're doing. But I knew in my heart that I was being tested. I knew that the Holy Spirit was testing me to see if I would be willing to say no and my family priorities really had that. And she said, I'll be happy to do that. Three days went by. I got a phone call back from Wisconsin. We're moving the date of our event. We'd like you to come. You know, I felt like the Holy Spirit honored me. There was this little private conversation between the two of us where he said, you did it right. I can trust you with more. You proved yourself faithful. I want to challenge you to know what to say no to. When we don't say no, it's often because we are afraid. We're afraid of A, disappointing people, B, being passed by, or C, missing out on opportunities. But I want to challenge you that when you know when to say no, God will trust you with more. Look at your current, or the, excuse me, the need to face current reality. When you and I face current reality, we, or when we don't face current reality, we call that denial. That's the second expression of courage. First expression is knowing when to say no. The second expression of courage is to be able to face current reality. When an individual refuses that, they're, they're in denial. Organizations, just like individuals, can also be in denial. Organizations are in denial often when leaders are in denial about their current state of affairs. You know what preachers love to do? We get together at these preacher conferences and we ask one another one question. How you doing? That's code for nickels and noses talk. How many people you got coming? How much money they given? That's what we want to know, all right? And nobody can lie better than somebody in the ministry. Now, we don't call it lying. We call it painting with broad strokes. Generously, I would say that we've got about, you know, and we, we talk about that because we are unwilling to face the current reality. Here's a quote from one of my favorite books, The Fifth Discipline. An accurate, insightful view of current reality is as important as a clear vision. Unfortunately, most of us are in the habit of imposing bias on our perceptions of current reality. If you fudge on the numbers, the people that follow you will think that you'll fudge on something else. And you lose credibility in that moment. Good leaders are willing to face and embrace current reality, regardless of how discouraging or sometimes how embarrassing it might be. And to be that kind of leader, you're going to have to do two things. If you're going to face current reality, these are two things you're going to have to do. Number one, you're going to have to be relentless in your quest to know the truth about what is happening around you. That is, you do not take one Report. You're looking for confirmation. You're like a, a, a newspaper reporter. I need two or three other sources saying the same thing, especially if it's a significant piece of information. Letter B, make your habit to root out misinformation and refuse to reward those who deliver it. If you have a subordinate that gives you information that has proven inaccurate in the past, you are duty-bound because you love them to say, is this accurate? Let me tell you why I'm asking a second time. You told me before, da 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 da, and I came to discover that that wasn't entirely accurate. I need accurate reports. When your subordinates understand that you will reward them for accurate information, you know what they're going to start bringing you? Accurate information. They think you want inflated reports because it makes everything look better than it really is. And if you reward that, 
you'll get that. All right, let's keep rocking. Uh, pick up where I left off. Number five, there we go. In doing so, you create a culture that is healthy and transparent. People will trust you. I pastored um, Creekside Church just north of Seattle for 20 years, and we had a deal with the congregation. Where things were going really good, I would tell them the truth. When things were going really bad, I would tell them the truth. When things were right in the middle, I wouldn't tell them anything. So they knew if we had something to say, that it was going to be accurate. Because I followed a leader that fudged on the numbers. He'd been there for 30 years. And I knew that I had to rebuild trust over that period of time. Facing and embracing current reality is often nasty, but it's necessary. It's nasty because it entails acknowledging that you may not be as far along as you want to be. It's necessary because you can't get to where you want to be if you don't accurately know where you are at. So here are seven commandments of current reality. Number one, thou shalt not pretend. Number two, thou shalt not turn a blind eye. Number three, thou shalt not exaggerate. In quotes, put preacher talk. Number four, Thou shalt not shoot the bearer of bad news. Number five, thou shalt not hide behind the numbers. Number six, thou shalt not ignore constructive criticism. And number seven, thou shalt not isolate yourself. When things go bad, when you're going through a hard season, you are tempted to isolate and insulate. And you can't do that. You've got to remember that you are part of a community of ministry. You need to get with others who will encourage you. All right. Here's the third mark. Courage to dream. Every great accomplishment began with a dream. Things are created twice, Stephen Covey said in his book, Seven Habits. They're created once in the mind, once with your hand. God calls us to use our imagination to dream up something new. A couple days ago, I went through Thomas Edison's uh, um, laboratory. The man created 1,065 inventions. Unbelievable! And you can see through his documentation where he credits God with his inspiration throughout his life. Every great accomplishment begins with a dream. Number two, it's not the most talented or the best educated who accomplish the most. It's the person, man or woman, who refuses to put brackets on their thinking. Dream not small dreams, for they stir not the hearts of men. If you fear your dreams, you'll never try anything new. If you fear your dreams, you'll never create anything new. And if you fear your dreams, you will never give the world anything new. Our fear to dream usually stems from our fear to fail. So we're going to wrap it up in the last couple of minutes. Here are some concluding questions and comments. As a leader, you have no idea what hangs in the balance of your decision to act courageously. You have no idea. Environments of uncertainty and fear are the fertile soil of an emerging leader. Throughout scripture, God commands kings and leaders to act courageously. Why does he do that? Because men and women of God, who are used by God, are no strangers to fear. Fear is a constant companion to those who act courageously. As a leader, do you have a difficult time saying no? What do you need to put on your not-to-do list? not your to-do list, what do you need to stop doing? One of the things that I discover about emerging leaders, young leaders who understand the organizational structure of the kingdom of God realize that we do not serve top-down, we serve bottom-up. That the kingdom of God is like an inverted V. Jesus said, the greatest in the kingdom is servant of all, right? And there's only one person who was actually serving everyone, and that's Jesus. He's at the bottom of that. 
So if you are holding on to power, holding on to position, holding on to information, knowledge, decisions, and not pushing it down to that others below you in the organizational structure or above you in the kingdom structure can make those kinds of decisions, you're not challenging them to move forward. What can you give away? You've got to constantly be giving the kingdom away. Show me a church that's plateaued, and I'll show you 75-year-old ushers that have been at the door for 40 years. I'll show you a piano player that hasn't moved off of the bench in three decades. And I'll show you people who are locked in their position. This is my ministry instead of training new people. But when you and I stand in front of Jesus, he's going to ask us one question. Did you make disciples? That's code for giving the kingdom away. Are you willing to give it away? Do you have the courage to say no to you doing it and let someone else do it? Give it away. That's the only way that the kingdom multiplies. Have you faced your current reality, especially in those areas that are uncomfortable? Are there any areas where you are pretending? What could be and possibly should be in your current areas of responsibility? And finally, has fear ever kept you from moving forward? A few years ago when I was uh, pastoring a local church, I decided to, well, I felt called to take a sabbatical. I'd not taken a sabbatical quite like this. It was 17 weeks long. My executive pastor really led the church during that period of time. And I remember talking to a friend of mine whose name is Troy. He was coaching me at the point. And I said, Troy, I'm no longer running staff. He goes, you shouldn't be. Your executive pastor should be doing that. I said, if I don't run the staff, what am I going to do? And he started laughing because he just asked his coach the very same question. And I realized that I was now part of a trickle-down scenario. He said, Don, trust God that your gifts will surface. And I said, okay. And I went on my sabbatical and I came back and the church had totally changed. When you take top leadership out of the mix, everyone below kind of moves up a notch. And I came back to lead my own church and realize that to some degree, I had been displaced. I'm not needed. I'm still the leader, but they're doing fine without me. In fact, I had our children's pastor, his name is Kate, come to me and she said, you know, about six or eight weeks into your sabbatical, Jason was leading and I realized if you never came back, we're gonna be okay. And she was saying that to make me feel better. What do you think it made me feel like? It did not make me feel better. I just smiled and said, oh, Kate, that's wonderful. And kind of grimaced underneath my breath. So I went away to be alone with God. And I felt the Holy Spirit say very clearly, you have been diligent at being a manager. Now I want you to be the leader I called you to be. Because managers always make sure that things are being done right. But leaders always make sure that the right things are being done. And it was after that period of time that God opened the door for me to write a book, to start a coaching network. In the last five years, we've trained over 600 pastors and local church leaders all around the nation. It's been an amazing thing. We now have two hubs, one in Seattle and one in Detroit. It's an amazing thing that I never would have been a part of if I hadn't had said, yes, I'll take a sabbatical and give my ministry away. You see, you reap what you sow. If you're holding on to ministry, I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit will pry it out of your cold hands because it's not yours. Never was, never will be. But when you give it away, he can trust you with more. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this time that we've had. A lot of times... The courage that we're needing is internal more than external. The courage to have the honest conversation in our heart before we have it on the outside with other people. I pray that we will choose to be obedient to you, to follow your leadings, and to recognize that all of our steps are connected in your mind, not ours. That you know the end from the beginning 
not us. And that we can trust you with creating a better future than we could create for ourselves. Because you love us so very, very deeply. We honor you when we obey you. In Jesus' good name we pray. Amen.